Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Applications of Deep Learning with Washington University. This is Module 6, Backpropagation Based Training, Part 1, Classic Backpropagation. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and um, restart the kernel and clear all output. So now we have nothing loaded, so we'll run the helpful functions that are at the top of every single one of these modules. You always want to make sure that you remember to do that. Because we will need these classes, or these uh, functions, as we make our way through this module. So classic backpropagation. Backpropagation has been around for a while. It is um, Jeffrey Hinton uh, contributed quite a bit to it, and um, Werbos as well. So a variety of people introduced aspects of backpropagation, and it has been continued to be built upon over, over many years. This equation that you see here is sort of your very general training equation. This just says that t, now t is the current uh, epoch or time, this is saying that the weights, which are the weights of theta, the weights for the current time are equal to the weights from the previous time minus v from the, the current time. v from the current time is just a vector, all of these are vectors, that holds the, um, the amounts that we're going to change each of the weights by. So this doesn't tell us a whole lot by itself. It just says that we are going to change the weights at each time by this vector of change amounts. Now the vector of change amounts, v sub t, we'll see a variety of functions that show us how to calculate v sub t. The first is classic backpropagation. So if we look at this, this is gradient descent. So you have eta multiplied by, now eta, is multiplied by the rest of this. This is essentially one unit. This is not this thing multiplied by the j function. This is the nabla, or the uh, upside down delta, or the harp shaped operator. This says take the gradients of the loss function with respect to the weights from the previous um, from the previous time step or the previous epoch. So this is essentially giving you all of the, the gradients multiplied by the learning rate, eta. Common values for the learning rate are these, 0 0.1, 0 0.01. Rarely would you ever want to make that one so that you're fully adding the gradients to the um, to the weights. That would, that would simply be too chaotic. Now let's see really what the gradient is and how it's actually used. This is a derivative. It's a partial derivative. So you always take the partial derivative of one univariate multivariate calculus, you take the derivative of one single variable in a multivariable expression, so one single weight with all other weights held constant. So this shows you essentially the error function for a particular weight. So the error for this weight, as you adjust the weight, so if you make the weight zero, the error is going to be here, then it goes up, and then it swings way down, and this is this is potentially true. As you vary just one weight in the neural network, the error function will go up, down, and change its value. Typically, we're doing gradient descent, so we want to get the weight all the way to the lowest point here. Now, we don't want to graph, generate this entire graph, and, and sample the neural network at each of these points. That would be computationally expensive because there is a different chart of this for every single weight in the entire neural network. And as you change one weight, all the, all the others potentially change too. This is where you have to do the partial derivative. We're doing the partial derivative for just one weight. And say the weight was currently at 
So all we would know is that the error was here. We don't have the rest of the of the lead up or continuation of the of the chart. We just have this one point. That point doesn't tell us too much until we take the derivative of the loss function. Then that tells us the instantaneous rate of change. So you've got the slope of this point right here on the error function curve. Notice this line has a negative slope. But if we if we just added that gradient to it, the negative value, whatever that negative slope is, that would decrease the weight. It would go in the wrong direction. So if you if you truly want to go this direction, because we're, we're past just a little bit of the crest of that hill, if you want to go in this direction, you need to take the opposite of the of the slope. That is why up here we're subtracting v sub t, because if this, I mean, say we're right here, then the line would be very much this, this direction, and that would be a very negatively sloped um, line. You would want a positive number, so you continued on your way down. If we were right here, then the slope would be positive, but we would want to subtract one from the weight to continue along this direction. So that is classic backpropagation. It's governed by the learning rate. If you made your learning rate too big, instead of gradient descending down here, you'd probably jump completely to the other side of it, and you would never find your way down to this lower value. So learning rate just describes how quickly we're going to attempt to push the weights to optimal values. And this link is pretty handy. It shows a JavaScript application that I wrote that takes you through all the steps of, of classic backpropagation. So you can see literally how an entire neural network is calculated for XOR. We'll look at that at a later part in this, uh, in this, this module. Next is momentum propagation, backpropagation. So momentum is something that was added to backpropagation to prevent from being settled from settling into a local minima. So local minima could be right here. It might be that further over here there'd be an even more optimal value, but once the weight gets settled into here, it's really hard for it to push its way completely out of that valley and continue on training. We have the case here. The weight, which is where that ball currently is at, is essentially stuck in a local minimum. There might be a global minimum here. It's really hard to know where the global minimum is. It's usually almost impossible. You can only approximate it by following the training and gradient descent. So this weight would have been continuing down, 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 but it would potentially get stuck here if not for the momentum that pushes it over the hump and allows it to continue. Momentum, just as its name implies, you can think of these weights as moving through um, high, high dimension space. Momentum just gives the, gives the weight push and continues that push as it maintains its momentum. This is the formula for um, for momentum. Now we have two hyperparameters. We have eta, which is the learning rate, but we also have lambda, which is the, um, the momentum rate. The first part of this is completely the same as classic backpropagation. You are simply taking the um, the gradient multiplied by the learning rate. But you have this additional term here, and this is the momentum term. This is lambda times vt minus 1. So whatever our previous delta, our previous update was, we're scaling it by lambda and adding it. You're just adding the last update scaled right onto the equation with everything else. 
That's really all that momentum is. So as you were moving down this, you would have built up a lot of momentum because you would potentially be moving down fairly fast. Then that change is very much a positive weight that would keep getting added onto the weight and hopefully push it over the hump and onto possibly out of the local minima and onto a better um, situation, hopefully. By the way, very common value for, for momentum is 0 0.9. They usually favor a fair amount of momentum, whereas learning rate is often much smaller. It's usually 0 0.1, 0 0.01, or some other uh, negative power of 10. Next, we're going to look at batch and online backpropagation. So this is an important concept for propagation training. We'll see later that we can configure these values in TensorFlow and determine what the batch sizes will be. Batch is simply how many training set elements do you need to go through. So each of these each of these gradients that we're calculating is for a single training set element. So you might have a thousand elements in your training set. How many of those, you don't have to literally update the weights every single time you calculate a training row and get the, uh, get the, the deltas to the, to the weight you can batch those up and you batch them up simply by summing up the gradients. So you process the first row of training, training data and you get a vector of gradients equal to, or of, of changes, the V, equal to the size of the weights. And you just, you can calculate the next training row and you add those gradients onto whatever you had before. You keep vector adding the gradients until you've made it um, to, to the batch size. So a batch size, if you had a batch size of 10, that means as it's going through the, the training set, it'll make it through 10 elements. And then at the end of the 10 elements, it has the gradients that are basically the sum of that whole run. And then it will apply the changes to the weights. Online training simply applies the change to the weight as soon as you get the um, uh, calculate the, the, the gradient, just one at a time. Calculate a gradient for one training row, apply it to the weights, move on to the next training row, calculate its gradients, add it to the, to the weights, and continue. Having the, the batch sizes, this, this can provide considerable efficiency to the training of the neural network. This is also very big data compliant because if you've got a very, very large data set, you just need to randomly sample many batches from it. So many batch training, that's another very common technique for training neural networks. Um, many batches are typically between 32 and 64 in size, so they're relatively small. Step and iteration, that is just how many training cycles has the, has the neural network gone through. Step, iteration, or even, and then epoch. So epoch is the number of times that you've made it through the complete training set. Step or iteration is how many, how many batches have you executed. All right, now we'll look at stochastic gradient descent which is often used in conjunction with many batch training. Stochastic gradient descent is used to, it provides a very stochastic or random descent. What's happening is rather than calculating the gradients with the current, um, with the entire data set, you just pick small groups and you keep going through these random samples with replacement of the, of the neural network training data. And as you go through each of these one by one by one, the error will decrease. It'll, it'll go up sometimes. See, sometimes you'll pick particularly bad sets of training data. Sometimes you'll pick particularly good sets. It just all pretty much depends. So stochastic gradient descent is often used alone or as part of another training set. 
It's computationally efficient, and it decreases overfitting by focusing only on a small number of relatively good weights. And also there's a variety of other techniques. Like I said, backpropagation and gradient descent, that's just the main um, backbone of this. There, some of these other techniques, what they attempt to solve is the learning rate and momentum. These are both hyperparameters. These are numbers that you need to tune along with everything else. You thought it was bad enough that you had to pick how many hidden layers and how many neurons you want on each hidden layer. Now you've got a learning rate and a momentum, and you need to figure out what the best learning rate is, what the best momentum is, so that you will be able to effectively train this neural network. The problem is the learning rate, if you adjust it too small, it's never going to accurately train your neural network. It's just not taking enough risk. If you make it too large, your neural network will be very, very erratic. And momentum, uh, same thing. If you make it too large, things become erratic. If you make it too small, it's not really having an effect. Also, if you think about it, this learning rate is being applied to every, neuro, every weight in the entire neural network. Maybe a single um, learning rate is not enough. Maybe some neurons are learning faster than others. So they like a concept of putting in multiple learning rates. Or you can also, sometimes you'll see that they will just automatically decrease the the learning rate as training progresses. So we're trying to move away from having every weight having a global learning rate and momentum, and then um, also move to making those, ver those values very sensitive, very non-sensitive, or very accommodating to values that weren't chosen so well. These are some other training techniques that we that I've worked with in the past. There's resilient propagation. It works pretty well. It basically recognizes that the sign of the gradient is probably the most important thing. It tells you which direction the weight should move to better optimize. Um, so it, um, it also does not need a learning rate and momentum. So it, it was popular back in the day. It's not seen as much use with uh, deep learning. Nesterov accelerated gradient, what that does is with stochastic gradient descent, it helps to mitigate the risk of just picking a really bad uh, mini batch that then damages the, the rest of the training that you've, that you've done. There's Adagrad and Adadelta. These are both, um, uh, it, it, Adagrad basically it keeps, it keeps a, de, a per weight decaying learning rate but it's monotonically decreasing. It never increases again. So that's why Ada Delta was created to address um, Adagrad's issues where that, that learning rate could just go in a direction and decrease to pretty much zero. There's also non-gradient methods. If you can't take a derivative of your loss function, these might be useful. This includes simulated annealing, genetic algorithms, particle swarm, Neldermead, and many more. All right, that is the end of this part. In the next part, we're going to see how, we're going to see some examples in JavaScript applications that I've written that will let you train a neural network and um, watch how the individual weights are actually changing.